Welcome back to Live with the Mod, the Poet Power by Revolution of One, where we have the greatest guests and most powerful conversations. And today is no different. Today we have a very powerful and very special guest on the show with us today. We got the fashion icon, artist, entrepreneur, filmmaker, cultural historian. We got the brother Akio Evans on the program with us today. How you doing today, King? Man, I'm blessed, man. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be here to talk to you to actually finally you know, have this conversation because I feel like I've had this conversation with every post and every content that you've created for us to uh, consume. And you've been at middle ground with just being able to give us uh, good food, you know what I mean? Mentally mm-hmm. and spiritually, you know, so uh, uh, blessings to you. Thank you for having me. You know, thank you for having me, bro. And I really appreciate that, bro. It's an honor to have you on and I'm, I'm a fan of your work. Um, I just love the way you curate content. I love the way you curate fashion. I love the way you curate conversations, um, the stuff that you do with um, the, your documentation, you know, just being a, a historian. Like I, I just, I, I don't know, it's something that attracted to me to your platform. You know, I don't follow that many people, but it's something that attracted me. And um, just the artwork that you do, man, I saw the piece that you did at Dick Gregory and I was just like, man, it was, it was, it was so powerful. Um, it's very few people that I see who, um, are just able to put a touch to certain things like that. I think the first time I've ever experienced something like that when 19 keys, I don't know if you're familiar with the brother, but when he was just starting out and he was really just more into the fashion sector, but just really getting into that uh, public speaking. And um, he used to walk around with a black Panther jacket and I was just like, Whoa. So when I had saw your stuff, I, it gave me that feeling. I'm like, man, this is some, this is some next level energy right here. Let me, let me tap in. And that's why I tapped in the 19 keys originally because of the jacket, you know, and I was just like, it just attracted me, but, um, man, it's a blessing to have you on the show. Um, I had saw you on another show. Um, I, I believe it was a Baltimore show. It was called be more open. And, um, you were talking about intellectual, uh, property. Um, and I wanted to, uh, start off by getting into intellectual property because it's something that, um, I know we both have dealt with before. Um, and I just want to talk about your journey into the fashion world and how you've learned the importance of intellectual property over time. And what's some of those moments that you saw your designs or you saw your influences go to different places and um, your eventual evolution to understand, like, I got to start stamping this, you know? Indeed. Well, I, I want to say, man, we're first starting off, man, uh, you know, creating stuff. I've noticed that I've always enjoyed like documenting it all comes full circle because in the essence of like creating these art pieces you're creating art capsules so you know mm-hmm. when i started actually making uh clothes it was because i seen one of my good friends who i found out later was my cousin uh shout out to jazz jasmine johnson you know basically was telling me like yo man um he had these uh baseball pass chains and i was just like y'all want them he said man all right better he introduced me to the guy the guy he did my pants but i wanted the nba patch chain and when he did my my pants he didn't give me all the teams i was frustrated and i had asked you know uh, my cousin jazz like how did he make him he was like yo he just did this that and the third you can do it too and that's and this was the only push that i needed to create and of mm-hmm. course with the sheets that i've used which was given to me by my mother she spent uh, grip on these sheets but i was cutting them up putting them on uh, the jeans it was the nba patches and um even then my mother was telling me like yo I don't think you should go to the mall with those jeans. Or well, I don't think mm. you should go to any of those public settings with those jeans on. See, my mother, she was a seamstress. She already was in the game. She mm. would sew stuff and, you know, kind of like gifted to individuals in the neighborhood for some people. And for some, she was selling. And uh, she was before her time because uh, fast forward a little bit. I remember in 2003, she was familiar with Jordans because my twin sister, she hooped. And my twin sister would always want to pay Jordans. It wasn't until like in her later, our uh, later years of, in, in high school that my mother was able to finally afford um, to give my sister something. And But my mother always knew the system that Jordan did, which was the Jordans didn't come out until a certain time. So I remember my mother telling me at a time where I was out of high school in 2001, she was like, yo, and it, my mother, she, I say yo a lot. So some of the women, right, when I when I be dating them or if I'm in a relationship with them, I say yo a lot. Mm-hmm. She like, yo, women be like, yo, why are you calling me yo? I say, yo, my mother would say yo. So anyway, mm-hmm. my mother would be like, my mother would be like, yo, like, why are you up there? You know what I'm saying? Um, 
this going to the mall with that. Like, I don't feel like you should do that. And number one, number two, I feel like you should, because I was going to the mall to brand and market myself to kind of like, that was the internet back in my day. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And she was like, I feel as though that you should only release certain pieces at a certain time. She said, you know how Jordan do? She said, you should probably get on. At the time, MySpace was out. I mean, my, my light went out. And uh, no, MySpace wasn't out. It was AOL. And I was like, yo, all right, bet. Let me, um, you know, kind of like stick with that in, in, in retrospect. But websites, as you know, Doug, like it was a grip to even have a website back in the day. If you not, if you don't know, if you was getting website, websites would cost damn near thousands of dollars. So mm. uh, y'all, I think that you should just only release your stuff at a certain time and then pull it back. And I didn't do that formula into 2020. My first drop was uh, the Meteor Man collection. And mm. again, it was because mother had introduced me and my siblings to media man so everything that i release whether it be dick gregory whether it be from my uncle who opened up for richard Pryor, he in baltimore it was only because mm. my mother loved Pryor. i own in this while you know, i got so many stories as i'm telling you this because it's in the creation or in the inten- being intentional about creating these pieces that i'm honoring my mother or my uncle that miracle territory happened and we'll explain that as we continue but it's it's so and it just even happened recently with the ludicrous but like i said i don't want to jump the gun but it's it's amazing how you know learning a little bit of what my mother was trying to tell me about uh you know releasing drops and not necessarily like showing everybody you know your 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 stuff um and because people sticking polaroids of the nba uh and this is before jeff hamilton did the jacket Mm -hmm. this is way before that happened and um to see that on the Aaron's old boy video. And I was like, yo, and people was calling me like, yo, yeah, yo, did you do that jacket? I said, no, nah, I didn't do that jacket. Doug, but that's, that was your idea. Did you? I said, yeah, I know, Doug, you know? So I learned later with healing from that situation is okay. Nothing is new under the sun. That's number one. Number two, each idea, the idea that you have in your mind and in your thought, it just does not stay with you. It actually kind of goes and that's, that's just me being, you know, cute about it. But it, it kind of like resides in other people. And if you don't do anything with that idea in, in time, it, 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 it exists in somewhere else. Because there's some incidences where mm. I take from other people. But it just so happened that I did just not just stay with you. It just uh, it has to come out. And when it comes out, it circulates and it enters some, someone else who may have. And you, you have done it in another way, you know. So that's what I've learned oh, and, and dealing with the many countless coincidences that have mm. been uh that slipped away out of out of me and went into somebody else and ultimately the ultimate goal was for people to you know wear it and 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 and, and now it's the time castle that supreme has reproduced um and so on and so forth but a lot of people mm. will argue and say no nah, yo you was you was the originator but you know I, I i i i'm at peace with now knowing that an idea just doesn't stay with you you know it's, mm. it, it lives free until you're able to do something with it, you know? So, yeah, man. No, I love that. I love that. Um, it just, it, it, it really uh, resonates with me because I've experienced that in uh, what I do, um, just using certain sounds, certain um, instrumentals and uh, certain soundtracks for my videos. Um, and then those soundtracks will go on to become, you know, very popular now, but I've been using them over the years. Um, and I, it, it makes me think about, um, a time when I, I had watched a million dollars worth of gain their drink champs episode and Wallow had shouted me out, um, because he had heard the sample that I was using in, um, Nas's album. Uh, I think the first King's disease, um, um, the first album. Um, and I was like, man, just for him to really immortalize me in culture, you know, just by shouting like, Hey man, I got to give it up to my man, Muhammad. He the one who was putting that out there. He made that sound popular and stuff. Cause while he's been tapped in since the very beginning. So I was just like, wow, man, like it's beautiful because we met, we may never get our credit and it's okay because we just do it from our spirit and our soul. And it made me also think about when you said that like thought travels, man, like thoughts travel, like it travels at a speed and you know, sometimes it hits you and then you didn't do nothing and it's going to the next and it's moving and it's crazy to think about that but i also wanted to talk about um 
real quick barriers to entry. Um, just you mentioned in the websites and how they used to cost thousands of bro. I did not know that. Talk about the barriers to entry into um like just doing fashion on a um small mom and pop level or a small like on a small scale back in the day. What were the barriers to entry? Like, you know, obviously not everybody can afford to get a storefront or uh, afford to uh get the best machines. And I, I heard you in another interview talking about how you was breaking it down to some of your students, and we're gonna get into that, but just about you know, the difference between extracting video from an actual, you know, DSLR camera than an, a camera that we're using on the iPhone. Like, what was the barriers to entry in, in the fashion world in those days? The barriers to entry in the fashion world and in the media world, man, was just so, it was a little difficult than what it is nowadays. Like, um, what even how I use my method of how I actually extract uh, images and put them on like the T-shirts and stuff like that. It's become somewhat of a, um, in my way, in my method, Not it's not a dying uh, uh, a platform or a dying art craft, but not too many people are doing it. So not too many people are doing it because the sweat equity of people wanting that instant gratification mm-hmm. of creating something, they want it right now. Uh, and you have other companies nowadays, I mean, uh, uh, now thousands of couple companies that you can just outsource and just say, hey, you know, I want this made and they'll send it to you. You lose the very process of wanting to, you know, um, be hands on with creating. And then back in the day, back in my day, like uh, I remember I used to walk around with my pole words because, again, you know, the Internet was at the time was only AOL. And it was only um, uh, MySpace. MySpace didn't come until later, but I would walk around with my Polaroids and I would just kind of like, you know, have them inside of a case. But before I put them in a case, I had them in my back pocket. And I feel like the thought, like how we talked before I get off topic of the thought that travels to other people. I feel like the thought had traveled through me, but I wasn't the right person at that time. Because Mm -hmm. even when, um, even like when I started making clothes heavy, it was like, I'm going to say when I got out of high school and within a year or two after me getting out of high school, my cousin Jazz, she said, Yo, I'm not staying here in Baltimore. I'm dipping. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a go, you know, to uh, Phoenix, Arizona to take care of, you know, to kind of for, for, uh, te- high tech institute. And I, I decided to stay. And when I stayed, you know, people was pulling me in different directions. So, you know, I started doing like uh, illegal things, whereas I was making like checks, I was making licenses, I was making uh, MTA passes for people to get on the bus for people who couldn't afford a $60 day pass. And I felt like I was being a Robin Hood of the hood. And I remember my mm. older sister was like, not kill, you're actually stealing. And I remember doing like the NVA title 04 and 05 stickers on the back of the license place. I would uh, collaborate with people who was, um, doing like uh, auction dealerships who didn't have a au- deal- the auctions license. And I would just get the paperwork and I would help them be able to get people on the road by just scanning literally. And back in the day, it was not, not as what it is today, whereas though you have technology that can, you know, foolproof the whole, uh, uh, well, you know, you, you, you know what it's a scam nowadays. Back in the day, it wasn't for me. But I feel like the thought had went into somebody else because they had singleness of purpose and singleness of focus. When they had singleness of purpose and singleness of focus, and my focus was how to uh, get over, because I used to be a thief. I used to do everything under the sun. And New Year's Eve, me and my friends used to light up, shoot guns on the roof, um, you know, of those who we thought who had betrayed us. Um, and while I was still on the run, I had two warrants. I had a warrant in Baltimore and a warrant in Phoenix. But a singleness of purpose and singleness of focus, right? When you're not in that, you're not in miracle territory for those ideas and your dreams to channel through you. And it's not, you might not even be in my situation. It might be in other situations that life happens, right? Where you might be in a relationship or your focus might be you having to survive, right? Again, when things flow easily, it's like the universe wills to you, let's become, let's, let's come to his aid. Or it can be a safety net or it can be a safety tool. Whereas though, okay, we want to bless you. The universe is saying, God's like, I want to bless you. But if I bless you, the people who you're connected to, uh, mm. they, they might. Wow. So I'm looking at all channels right now. And, and, and as it relates to why things could have not happened the way they should have happened, the way I wanted them to happen um, versus me being bitter about it, thinking that, and because if you be bitter about it, that energy, that frequency, it's the wealth frequency and the property frequency. That wealth frequency or that 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 prosperous frequency, that thriving frequency, you know that you can get another break again. Like like mm-hmm. like yo, 
you be releasing. I see your content all the time. I'm following your content for years. It's like it's like it comes easily and effortlessly. And then now it got to the point where you're not even worry about what people would worry about as far as fueling or having people to visit you or you being the source. You're now trying to educate people, people so they where they can live longer. If you mm. see your content how it changed, she's like, okay, I'm gonna still give you these gems, and I'm gonna still be one of the people that's gonna be on the interview giving you gems, and I'm gonna still admire like people that I uh, looked at interviews. I'm gonna give you all three of those things, but those three things is good. But what good is those three things if I don't give you this every once in a while? Sprinkle this video of how you can uh, better your health, how you can have mm. clean teeth. <laughs> those three things don't mean nothing if I don't give you this. So it all comes together, you know what I'm saying? So um, it's just powerful, bro. But I feel like with um, the barriers that was in hand with how I was trying to get out there, uh, you had to be, you had to do the footwork. But then it was in that footwork that I wound up meeting DMX. It was in that mm. footwork that I, that even though that I, my old clothing line was called Ricochet and my, my father, his name is Roscoe. And uh, Roscoe, as we know in hip hop, is referred to as a Glock, is referred to as a gun. So mm. when I seen this, they had the R. Um, that was a you know pistol. So ricochet for me, um, it was like I was a son of a gun, right? Mm. And I was ricocheting through different states because I was on a run, and uh, but I wasn't the right person. Um, but the barriers of the filmmaking, it was hard before YouTube came out because you had to take a high eight or or, or a, a tape, and then after you record it, you had to take that tape and you had to find ways to extract it digitally. And if you didn't have the access to extract it digitally, you would take uh, another VHS tape, VHS tape, put it into a VHS tape. It just was very difficult, bro. Versus now, mm. that's why I tell, that's why I tell the kids now. I'm like, yo, you have what I wanted to have as a 16 year old. I just wanted a video camera so I could shoot films. You have it right now in your possession. No, I don't care. You don't need the up to date camera because guess what? People have films that has been on Netflix with just the phone that you have in your pocket. It's an investment. Mm. It's, it don't cost a grand just to cost a grand. It's literally a whole entire studio in your pocket. If you, and if they say, oh, okay, okay, we'll look at individuals like we mentioned, uh, Wallow, or look at individuals who created and made a name for themselves with the very small. So, and that's why I mentioned Basquiat in that clip that you talked about, because it's not taking shots of Basquiat. I love Basquiat, but what I'm saying is, is that if you're using what society paints is, Oh, you're not this, or you're not that, or you're not this artist, you're not that. Who told you that? Who told you that you needed to be this way? Who told you that you needed to, it's culinary arts, you know what I mean? Speaking is an art form. I mean, hey, even the person on the street, how he has to get the gab, how he's able to persuade you in to extract that from you, that's a negotiator, that's an art. So everything is art, but that's not, they, they don't want it, they don't want you to know that you have already embedded you art because they know mm. that that art can translate into entrepreneurship so that way they don't have to control you to actually, you know, so we are in an early age, know that we are naturally gifted in that way, that we can turn those gifts and we can turn the arts that we have because it's endless into businesses sooner than later. Because if I know mm -hmm. that I can do what I can do when I was on a run, when I was homeless in Phoenix, Arizona, I would have known that I can done it. I could have done this sooner than later, but I wasn't the right person, man. I wasn't the right person. But now I'm in my May 30, almost 38, 39, I'm now grabbing in the, the opportunities, uh, you know, by the horns because I'm never, I'm being the right person now. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, man, yeah, I hope that explains a little bit of uh, the boundaries and because it's not more so the boundaries of with the technology because it was individuals that were thriving without having, um, it was just, it's all of the boundaries is all about being the right person. That can be the only main thing. Because like, mm. granted, yeah, I, the internet, yeah, I didn't have this in the third, but I was still <laughs> doing what I was doing, bro. Mm. And I was, you know, I, I wasn't the right person. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, man. Yeah. I love that. You are your biggest boundary. And and, mm -hmm. and I love that. And, and, and just talking about, um, I, I, just talking about art, you know, how there's an art to talk and how there's an art to speaking and then there's art to listening like life is art man and that, that just hit me when you said i'm like dang life really is art like there's an art to silence there's an art to everything we do in life is really art you can be an artist in everything because i've i know people who listen like they're really good listeners 
And it's like an art to them. Like it's like next level. And it's people who can speak on the next level. It's people who can do all type of things. And it's once you do it proficiently, it becomes art. <laughs> it's like, you know, are we just doing this? Or are we doing it at like a masterful level? Or are we doing it at like a creative level? Are we really into it? Then it becomes art. And it's just like, man, like that, that, that hit me when you said that. I want to talk about the, um, the art of networking, man. Cause you talk about meeting DMX and just, um, just being a, a historian and being able to document different things that's happening uh, in, in, in Baltimore, man. And just being a, a hip hop historian in that, in that city, man. Um, talk to me about networking. You know, uh, you, you have a large network from the Dave Chappelle to the Kevin Hart's to, uh, the Donnell Rawlings to the Allen Iversons, who's one of my personal favorites. Um, Nick Cannon, it's, it's so many more, the list goes on and on. Um, Dr. Dre is like, um, Talk about the art of networking. And 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 I'm curious about this because I don't know the answer, but I, I is service a part of that? Is 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 um because when I was networking, doing my internships growing up in college and really networking and making the connections that I did in social media, I would always offer up my services for free. I did a lot of stuff for free to get to another level. And I don't know if that's your story, but I, I'm curious, that, like, what, what's the art to networking? Tell us the art to networking. Mm, well, I'll go into what's been uh, making my business a, lot, a little uh, thriving. Uh, so with mm. the, what I call the Shumiro art. Shumiro art, I named it, I had to name it differently because some people, they all, when they mention customs for some people, they look at customs as something that you can get on Etsy for, let's say for the same amount that you would spend on a pair of sneakers in a store. And mm. what I be teaching people is that, no, 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 no. If I put my signature on there and the story that's, that's attached to it, then it's valuable. Most of the customs that you see, that's just a quick grab, or I want to do 10 to make this quick profit. Sometimes it doesn't have a story that's attached to it. That's meaningful. So, uh, so to wind back a little bit of, how I've been able to network. A few of my friends, when they started, well, Snoop Pearson in particular, she was like, yo, when I first met you on Set of the Wire, you was making clothes while you stopped. And I was like, mm. yo, well, I mean, I'm, I'm doing the film thing. She was like, yo, like, do both. And um, I said, okay. She said, as a matter of fact, you know, what I'm telling you what you used to do back in the day when I first met you, it's in now. This is in November 2014. It's in now, Keo. Like, yo, as a matter of fact, I'm going to just commission you to make me a pair of Thames and you just do that. We'll share it on my account, see what it do. And she did that. And when she, when I did them, um, you know, I did it effortlessly too. And uh, it was like, I call them the Wire HD Thames. They had mm. some nails uh, inside the leather cushion parts. Um, it basically was based on our character off the Wire. And, uh, she posted it and that's how it got the attention of Donna Rollins and Donna Rollins. He didn't reach, he reached out to me immediately shared contacts, but we didn't really um, wind up seeing each other until the Baltimore uprising in April. That was November, 2014 when we was in communication with each other. And it wasn't until the springtime that he came to Baltimore. And when he came to Baltimore, he was like, yeah, yo Doug, I'm ready to get the shoes. Um, you still got me. Right. I said, yeah, yo, I said, but yo, all the stores are shut down, bro. Giving him excuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, yo, that's funny, yo. Like, I'm, I'm sad, no, yo. I know that you, you know I me, mean? you can go to the county somewhere. Because again, what I talked about, not the boundaries that I have for myself, I was about, I was in the give up mode because I was still like going through a breakup, a seven year breakup at the time in 2015. And that I, 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 I was about to eliminate that opportunity. And I'm glad that my um, the person who I was with at the time, she said, look, I know what we got, got going on. I know that, you know, X, Y, and Z, but look, please don't let this opportunity slip away because, you know, so she didn't want to take responsibility for that because, you know, mm -hmm. so I was like, all right, cool. I pressed forward and and that's when I, uh, I stayed up, sent in the, sent Donnell the uh, actual finished product. I took about an hour or so nap. I remember what I said about the universe and, but God will aid you when you actually have blind faith. So I knowing that after I came back in at 2 a.m. in the morning, because it was a fire that erupted in East Baltimore that had nothing to do with the uprising that happened over West Baltimore. But the hood was saying it was an inside job because people had knew what was going on with West. And some people who own businesses was like, oh, snap, let's take advantage of this opportunity because insurance. Right. So anyway, mm -hmm. that um, the repercussions of that, the fire that he had erupted in East Baltimore had went on some of the houses and one of the houses in particular was 
uh, the person who I used to be with family. So we were up there, we came to their aid uh, and I stayed up to two o'clock in the morning and I was mm-hmm. not ready for the sneakers. I was like, yo, and Donna was like, yo, I'll see, this, see you tomorrow, right? I said, nah, Doug, you know what I'm saying? But um, mm-hmm. again, that defeats, right? So by me saying yes to that, I staying up to about five or six o'clock in the morning, doing his sneakers, um, sending it to him. And I said, I'm about to get an hour of sleep because I still had, I was working at Hopkins at the time, Hopkins University. And when I got the text message from him around 10 a.m. in the morning, not only was Hopkins off that day, the university said, hey, because they was paranoid, they ain't what, because like I said, what had happened in East Baltimore was not too far from their backyard. So they had said that everybody that wasn't essential can stay home. So that gave me enough time to get more rest. And I checked my text message from Darnell. Darnell said, yo, the shoes are dope. Dave wants a pair. I didn't know that by him, Mm. me sending him. And so that was in 2014. Since then, Dave has owned three pairs of sneakers. But in the very beginning, I will say this. I did give my gift away. I did give my gift away. And I, and I didn't know what I was doing. Even my friends was like, yo, Jada is coming to town. Yo, hey, look, we want to find a shoe size. We found a shoe size and I gave my gift away to him. In the beginning, to the point where, you know, when you give gift away, it's only a seed that's going to germinate and it's going to continue to grow so to the point where you're not knowing that you are having your name and having your art done in the best ability that you can do it. Still creating mm. it from what Art, not slapping nothing together, really making it stand out. So that way, when you when they, when these people see what you are presenting to them, they know that you put your heart into this. Because if it was anything else, just for the sake of the opportunity for you to take a photo, or just because you said you did what you did, then it would have not been none of that, right? So, giving my gift away in the beginning was my network, and not knowing that that was going to help me in the long run, not knowing that that was going to build up the seed that was planted as far as other people seeing that my name was attached to these celebrities to the point where they automatically thought that they, which I'm dealing with now, hey, let me go ahead and commission this man. All that stuff started to come into play. I didn't know what commission was. I didn't know, um, I was I was drafting invoices, sending invoices out, but I wasn't, I had to learn, I learned by doing. And all the stuff coming in my aid of me just giving my gift away, um, then in come production studios reaching out to me to get stuff done. But it was all preparation. It was all service that had mm-hmm. allowed me to get into those rooms and the service of others. What I mean by that, the service of Alan Iverson's braider, who've been servicing Alan Iverson for a very long time. Who, who, what do you give a billionaire like Dr. Dre? For an individual who know these people. So these people who are connected to these individuals who know these millionaires and Knowing, like, what do I give, you know, Al Iverson, a Dr. Dre, a, 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 a Kevin Hart, what do I give them as a birthday gift? You know what? Oh, I'm going to contact this guy because he's operating his gift to his utmost ability. And I'm going to use his gift to gift. The, so, so it's a win-win situation. And now, and then to get to the point where I'm being paid to do that, you know, so you, you start to get, you start to, you know, win uh, yourself in these circles, in these arenas, and the word of mouth to like, yo, I see what you did for X, Y, Z. Hey, man, I want to do something for uh, own TV. Hey, uh, what, what is it? Can we do eight pairs? Or you you say you charge twelve hundred a piece? Yeah, because these are just going to be display pieces. These are not going to mm. be worn. We're going to charge you eighteen to eighteen hundred a piece. You said for Marvel. Oh, okay, we're just mm. going to do that because these are not going to be worn to the point where individuals like Kevin Hart was already saying stuff to me that I wasn't even necessarily like budging to when he said like, yo, I'm putting your shoes up. Or when people say I'm putting your stuff up, I didn't know what that meant because it, mm. even me, I didn't value art. I was in that custom mind frame. But then I listened to this guy named Eric Thomas and he's talked about how you, know, you have to reword what you're doing. You got to name it. He said, people was like, yo, you're a preacher. He said, but I was in the midst of being a preacher and a businessman. And yeah, rightfully so I was a preacher, but you know, I, I, I'm not a, 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 a traditional preacher because he's all about relationship and not religion. Like, yo, what mm. good is it that you have relationships with your wife? I mean, not a good relationship with your wife, not a good relationship with your son. But what good is that title of saying yeah, he's my son or he's she's my wife when well, you don't have a good relationship with it? So, so, so the creator, what's good is that? Right. So anyway, with that being said, what, what is the name behind what I'm doing? It's not customs because. You got individuals that are crying when they receive it. You got individuals that are saying that they're not going to want to wear this. Okay, I'm muralizing. And I started listening to what people were saying. Yo, you put, you're put muralizing individuals. Yo, you put murals on sneakers. Ah, the shoe muralist. So you're naming it. 
create something else um, with it. So names are powerful too. What are you naming uh, what you're doing? Uh, does it have a name? And if it doesn't have a name, can you create a name? And when you create a name, can you create something that 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 is going to make an impact to it as though you, you can change the whole entire dynamic of what you're doing? So um, it's because it's still documentation. I'm still creating, putting legacy onto a shoe. Mm-hmm. Just, it's a storytelling piece because we're storytellers. You know what I mean? We we preserve other people's stories. You get what I'm saying? So, and I'm doing that on sneakers. You know what I mean? Well, I'm doing that on any platform, whether it be media. You you, you look at that grid. You look at our grid. Mm-hmm. It's a story. It's a part one and part two. So yeah, man, it's a, it's a dope experience, bro. Dope experience. <laughs> And I love your breakdown because it's like that's somewhat similar to my breakdown, especially when I got into media, uh, getting guests on the show. Originally, a lot of people, well, a a lot of people was already followers of my platform, so it helped a lot. But for people that I wasn't connected with, it's like, who's the man next to the man or who's the man next to the man who's next to the man? That's the key. Pete, we're giving you free get like this is real, like. He said the hairdresser of AI, that's the connect. It's like just small. People don't think about this stuff. Me, I'm a person. I will search out the person who's next to the person who's next. That's my gift. I can find the person. I will find the publicist assistant to this person. And I'll like, I'll be Google searching and doing like, it takes extensive research. A lot of people are like, man, how did he get? It takes research. And what I often do was find who's connected to me because if the assistant to the publicist, to the person follows my platform, I can tap in with the assistant to get to the publicist, to get to the person. But it's all about who's familiar with me. Now, otherwise I might just come off of, see, cause some days you're going to connect with people off of who, you know, other people, other times you can connect off your work. And it's just like, here's my work. Can we work together? And other times it's like, all right, well, let me see if this person is familiar with something or is in a lane that I'm in like, Oh, they're proficient. They, they're really into mental health. So let me get them on my show. So maybe my show is something that they're in enthralled in. Maybe my show is something that they're already interested in that field. So it's just like multiple different ways to network and connect. But I love when you said that, like you find, and the person is connected and it's all connected down and Rollins to get to this, to get to Dave Chappelle. And, and then it, 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 it's like a snowball effect and just yeah. giving that free, just free. Cause people don't understand. They, they don't want to do nothing for free. Man, I did a lot of stuff for free, a lot of stuff for free, man. I'm talking about people. My mom thought I was crazy when I was, um, I was like my, my, my sophomore and my freshman year, I was doing um an internship for a, a sports journalism and I was just doing so much content like do you see the amount of content that I do uh for the ancestral plan I man I was doing three four times the amount of content I was running every platform a, a major league baseball platform I was running a football platform and a basketball platform I was running a whole department putting out all the content I'm talking about making content on the road while I'm driving and that's where I got the skill to edit on another level on major platforms like um Adobe Premiere and then on smaller stuff like iMovie I learned all that doing sports like I learned how to do everything that I do now doing sports it all prepares you so it's all aligned like you said it's all aligned if you really just be still and quiet enough it's all aligned but I'm telling you like I did so much for free and I don't regret any of it but I did a lot for free man I, I was made promises that never came through, but I didn't know like, Hey, my promise was never meant to come in that opportunity. God was just preparing me for something greater. I was being prepared for something greater. My promise was what God was promised. It wasn't what they was promised. Cause they promised me a lot and I didn't get nothing that I was promised, but I got what I was intended to get. You know what I'm saying? I put out a tweet. One thing I don't want us to miss is mm. the, the quality level of free. Like we can do things for free. Mm, yes. But the yes. quality level of the free, the quality we put into that free. Yes. Like and, and, and then the quality that you put into what you would do for free when you are being paid for what to, what you need to do. Because guess mm. what? You still are being paid right now. These are investments. Like I said, that that seed mm. is German. What we're now understanding what digital content is is digital real estate. You know what mm. I mean? So you have different markets. They were your digital real estate houses because what good was real estate in a pandemic where you had mm. people not but digital real estate did what? It increased because everybody mm. wanted a platform to be able to say, okay, can I put your stuff on your platform? Can I use that in third? And then once you continue to make what you do valuable in the free, the quality of the free, then people like Alan Officer's Brady will start reaching out to you. And that, what I when you said aligned, that was also in alignment 
of me <laughs> being in after a run, went into these woods, mm. was proud of myself from actually being on a, being on the run. And I didn't even know my friend was recording me the whole time. And I guess what? I was just coming out of another breakup, right? So what I want to, people to understand too is that when you're coming out of these breakups, when, when life is smacking you right in the midst of that, it's like still, and I use miracle territory all the time, it's like a blessing that's about to happen right in after that if you don't allow, allow it to defeat you. Because I didn't know he was mm. recording me all the time while we was on our run. He had a hangover, and I was just saying stuff. I was like, yeah, bro, you know, I just feel like, I forgot what I was saying, but it was, it was the video was still on my um on my uh, IG, if you dig through. But after our run, after we left the trail, then that's when Alan Obviously is a brave that she who's been following me for a while. She reached out randomly and said, Hey, um, I don't know if you ever did any work for AI, but and I just said, yo, I was crazy. I was just in the woods actually saying out my mouth that our opportunity was on its way. And it mm-hmm. came right then. I have so many stories like that. That's that's to being in a, being in alignment, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. with 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 the gift. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I love that. And I wanted to touch on um I wanted to touch on uh name, image, and likeness. I want to touch on that in a second, but I want to talk about the uh shoe muralist, uh the program, um, because you touched on it. Um the and just the work that you're doing with the with the uh students, man, and the community, the youth. And uh when I saw you do that, um just the, the workshops that you're doing, like I was just like, man, that's powerful. Can you talk about the workshops that you're doing in the community? Man, the workshop's been nothing but, again, alignment, man. Um, you know, I've been pitching it for a very long time, seeing it out my mouth that I wanted to do it since 2016. And when it finally came to light, it was all within a connection of me being in a coffee shop. The coffee shop was named Vent Coffee. Mm-hmm. And then I was sharing, I was talking to my homeboy, Larry, and me and Larry was just talking about Baltimore and the depiction that Baltimore has and why I just stand there. We was talking about how so much positive stuff going on. And... In that moment, I was in that in that same week, um, I had left another studio because it was no longer um, and we were we, the, the, the peers who was in charge of that studio. Everybody that was there had to vacate the premises. But I still knowing that pressed the green light on ha- uh, having a workshop, not knowing where I was going to have a workshop at, but I, I was going to figure it out. Blind mm-hmm. faith, right? And then in that in that in that coffee shop, it walks this guy. Um, shout out to Mike, you know what I'm saying? And uh that's how it, it that connection had 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 turned into what you see or what you have seen the workshops to be today. And I started not to show up at that coffee shop, you know what I'm saying? So the wood so anyway, um the workshop, man, it's been beautiful, man. Um I've I've wanted to um actually do paint nights for some who just wants to create something. And even then when they create something, I've noticed that everybody, if they haven't done, they, they haven't done that before, it's like the same um, young minds that's in those classrooms when I used to bring the shoes on Friday and they, here it is, they're looking mm-hmm. at them. Whether the canvas is a, a fresh pair of sneakers or not, they're like, what can I do with this? And when I see that, you know, people my age are doing the same thing, they are now in my shoes as to how I felt when I did Dr. Dre sneakers. Not knowing how it worked in the, in the end, or not knowing like, dang, this is it. But then me, if I'm being commissioned to do these sneakers, I only got a small time frame and I got to get over real fast. So by the time people be asking me, man, how was it like making Dr. Dre sneakers? Doug, I don't even know, Doug, because mm-hmm. by the time I even like, how you feel? I'm like, Doug, I, ain't, I don't even know how I feel about it because I'm still like amazed at the fact that I yeah. did it because I was still shaking my boots was as I was doing that. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, man, the workshop's been, it's been, it's been a blessing just to be the workshop has just been a blessing for me to be able to, you know, share that experience with all walks of life, man. And, you know, I'm still um, science it out as what Dabber Dad would say. I'm still science and everything out. Uh, but I want to be able to um, share with people that we are all valuable, Doug. Like, I don't, we don't have to, you know, whatever story that you've attached to that piece that you've done. You get what I'm saying? It's valuable. It's valuable. We don't have to. When you put your signature on that thing, I, it, it, I'm going to say this too, dog, because manifestation is so real. It's so real, bro. Like in January, I wrote down and I said this in my one of my posts as well. I wrote down uh, it was number 27. I was going to collaborate with Converse. I had no mm. idea. Now I'm going to collaborate with Converse 
since I started, when I first started making sneakers, as you can see, the first John R. Rollins and the first Dave Chappelle sneakers, it was Converse. I was afraid to touch an Air Force One. I've touched Air Force Ones in 2004, 2005. But then when I started making stuff again in 2014, I was like, uh, you know what I'm saying? The, the muscle memory was gone. And mm. until we have the muscle memory, is the same way as us creating your art pieces, the same way as, you know, you step away. You, it's good if you take the hiatus off of social media, but the muscle memory acts as just as, uh, as an algorithm does. When you get back into the rhythm of actually posting or getting back into the rhythm of creating art, you have to get back into the rhythm to be in flow again. You get what I'm saying? So, you know, all those things work. You know, when we are in flow, but I would be wanting to share with people like, yo, we ain't got to wait till, you know, we reach our demise to understand that we're valuable or what we create is valuable to the point where I'm saying that when people finish the actual course or they finish the actual class, they go from saying, yeah, I'm going to wear this for the Ravens game, I'm going to wear this to, to, to saying like, hey, man, so how that piece turned out? Y'all got it on my mantle. I ain't want it. And I'm like, wow. So hey, they went from even how. They said that they were going to like wear for mm. games instead of third to say like, yeah, yeah, I'll put it up. Because you know why? Because they I, I, they poured in their heart into it. You get what I'm saying? And that's what it's all about because now things are, we're not looking at, some of us are, but most of us, families are broken. So we don't have grandma's photo album to look at anymore. Sad mm. to say, we have a phone, but we don't have grandma's. If something was different and was magical when you was touching that photo album, you know, you touching, not only did you touch it, but your grandfather might have touched it. So it's, it's, it's power even you being able mm. to embrace it. That is being gone. So what we can do now is create that same type of energy and translate it into whatever art meeting that we do, whether it be shoes, whether it be what we're doing right now in this conversation. So people can feel again. Mm. People ain't feeling and, I, and, 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 and it's not customs when you think it, customs is good, you know what I mean? Because customs come from the original Godfather, salute to dad, but dad, I look up to him and all that. But, you know, he's done what he's done. He's paid the way he, what he's done. What can we do to add to the world? What can we do to birth something new? So that way, you know, we can create new for the people who feel like they have to uh, do that. You don't have to do that. You're here. You, we, we don't have to follow something else we can add. But we have to do something different so that way we can contribute something different to the world for all of us to benefit from. So that's why I'm on. I'm on being able to create. So that way, when I see people who are eye to eye with, with the vision, when I'm being contacted by these production studios, then mm -hmm. I, and instead of me trying to figure out how I'm going to do 40 pairs of sneakers, I can create an ensemble of people who is interested in creating. And I can have a quick turnaround time you know, for all of us to collectively create something special because, you know, and again, uh, that goes back into the alignment factor, man. I got so many things about the Spike Lee thing, how that was spoken to existence. Uh, recently, the Luda thing was spoken to existence. Um, and these are things that we all possess. That's a, that's another fraction of the creativity. And that's all I'm seeing mm. right now. Yeah, yeah man. It's so no, powerful. I'm, I'm, it is, it is. It's powerful, man. Just... Just talking about how everything comes together, man. I love hearing people's stories because it really just helps you understand like miracles happen on the road to your purpose. Like, you know, those miracles happen when you're taking steps and, that, and a lot of people be like, man, where's my miracle moment? Where's this? It's because you're not on the path. Like God will guide you, you know, the universe will guide you to get to where you're supposed to go. But the big stuff, the stuff that's like, whoa, man, I was supposed to go to this concert and then I met this guy and blah, blah, blah. It only happens when you're constantly in your purpose. Just like you said, you said it's something like, hey man, an opportunity is coming. But regardless of good or bad, I'm getting to the mission. I don't care what your mission is. If it's just making donuts to get a donut shop and now you're going through it, but you're like, man, how can I get that donut shop? It's on your mind. It's constantly on your mind. Like the donut shop is constantly on your mind. You're thinking about opening up a, a, a store where you, where you doing tailor work or whatever, whatever is on your heart, man. Um, and it's just like, if as long as it's constantly on your mind, and, and constantly in conversation, keep it constantly in conversation, because that's one of the ways that I was able to bring a whole lot of opportunities. People ask me what you do. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm a podcaster. Like I do this. I'm about mental health. But when you speak 
about what you're interested in and what you're working on. People want to meet you where you are. They want to be, oh, well, I know something about that or my uncle is in that or, you know, I know AI, he's doing this. Blah, blah, blah. People want to meet, but they're not going to give you that game or let you know unless you let them know what you're interested in. People want to build with you about where you're at. They're like, what are you into? But if you're just like, no, nah, man, I'm good. I'm I'm working on some projects right now. The blessing can't come through because they're not, like if you tell me, hey, man, I'm really interested in so-and-so or I'm really interested in doing this. I know so-and-so. Hey, yeah, bro, yeah. Yeah, I know someone I was just with him last week. That gym can't come to get the, the, the blessing can't come through because you being too uptight. We being mm-hmm. vulnerable. We open in our hearts so the blessings is coming through. If you mm-hmm. open your heart, then the blessing can come through. A closed heart that's trying to be all this and all that. A true artist is open hearted. When you think about poetry, when you think about artistry, when you think about conversation, when you think about listen, this is an open heart. It's artists is open. We open our the best art they open, man. And that's what makes us receive these blessings the way we do. A lot of people be like, man, starving artists and all this stuff. Artists is never starving because we receive the fruits of the universe and we take the fruits of the universe and we make different things with it, man. Like for I never knew how I was gonna be able to make money podcasts and make money doing poetry, make money doing these different things. And then somebody reached out to me from North Carolina Central said, Hey man, we want you to do some poetry over here. I don't know how to how to move and shake as an artist. I don't know how to move and shake. But once you open your heart up to the universe, it all comes through, man. And it ain't no starving artist, man. We eating over here. All artists, we eat from the universe, man. See, that that's the thing about the artists we 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 eat from the fruits and the trees of the universe everybody else is trying to eat from the, the different thing that's on the plate and the material and stuff the artist just pull from his life man he just sit in the silence he just sit in the sun and then he manifests something to eat from he manifests the plate that's what we do yeah. we manifesting plates y'all yeah, trying to get a plate we manifesting plates man manifestation of how just recently that happened about a week or two ago with the beauty mm. crystal you know i'm up there it was funny because like i said with energy, energy can exist in any and everything, even stuff that people leave behind. There's energy behind that. So mm-hmm. I had this bomb that my mother had gave me for years. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know how I even managed to keep this joint because I was on a run. I was in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm-hmm. I was in OK Washington. I was on a run. But for whatever reason, you know what I mean? I kept it probably because I know why I was on a run that my mother, with the message that she wrote inside of that, and it's still mm-hmm. fresh. Like, like, yo, how is that Bible just so fresh? Mainly some of it because I, I barely read it when I was when I was young. But yo, it's energy behind it. So this the reason why that is so attached to the story is because um, it was on. A, I sometimes work at the night joints so where I do twelve a.m. to eight a.m. You know what I mean? Some nights. So this one particular night, I rested in the evening and woke up at ten forty eight. And I say, all right, let me access my phone. If I access my phone, I stay up. If I mm-hmm. put this phone back down. I'm gonna say bump that situation. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back to sleep. You know what I'm saying? Um, Cause I hardly get sleep. People are like I. I need to do more of that. But um, it's in the submissive of when you're sleepy, when you're about to fall asleep, or when you're just waking up with the subconscious mind is easily impre- easily impressionable. Um, and you can it's magic within that too. So anyway, 1048. I, I seen my phone and I started browsing through my phone and I went on Facebook. I never really be on Facebook like that, dog let alone to see an ad. And I seen this ad and had Ludacris on that. He was rapping and it was crazy because he put this peanut butter gif in his mouth and he started like rapping and his sprays was unraveling and it turned into an afro. Now, being though that you and I were filmmakers, I was looking at it, you know, how in the world did they do that? I'm looking at the effects. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. And then it was like 11, 10. I said, oh, snap, let me get myself up. You know what I mean? So I can be at my appointment in time. So then I got up, you know, and I got off at 8 a.m. the next day. But that Tuesday night going on to Wednesday, which was May 10th, um, I uh, was just like exhausted. I said, but yo, before you go back, you're going to get some breakfast because you ain't have a good breakfast in a while. And yo, get a loaf of bread too, Doug, because yo, you you know, you've been running through your jelly sandwiches because I like to make peanut butter jelly sandwiches as a snack. And I said, oh, I need to get me a, I need to get me a Jif. I need to get me a Jif peanut butter too. So I go to the store. And I got my breakfast sandwich. I got the loaf of bread. I said, oh, let me not forget the Jif. And as I walk into the peanut butter aisle where the Jif was, I started chuckling to myself. I said, yo, didn't I just see an ad a little Chris just the other day? And then I, that's when I was close to the Jif and I grabbed the bottle. And I looked at it. I said, well, I'm about to be on my little Chris. I went to the self-checkout, mm. checked out and all that. And then right when I came to my spot, my friend was like, yo, you got to release the shoes to the video, yo, because if you don't, somebody else... They, again, the universe, right? Somebody else is going to release a video just like it. And because we've seen this happen before. So you need to go ahead. I don't know what you got to do, Doug, but edit that video. So I went 
And I noticed I needed some B-roll. I needed some B-roll with me putting the car in park and all this other stuff. So I went out, put the same outfit I had on um, that I had on the day that I shot it the first time. And I, I paused to join up, finished. Now, keep in mind, I, oh, yeah, I'm skipping stuff. I kept seeing sevens that prior weekend. So that's why I was afraid. I ain't going to lie to you. I was shook. I said, why keep it? I mean, it, I was seeing sevens not on the phone. I'm talking about when I was reading the book it was seven right there. I was it that had me shook though. Where so I was like, yo, this is I don't know what, what God is trying to tell me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put this bomb in the bed, yo, because I was kind of afraid, yo. I ain't know. I said something. Mm. Is somebody something about to happen to somebody? Like, what message was something something about to happen? Because it was so weird, bro. It was so weird. So anyway, fast forward to Hearst Tita. It was at seven a.m. Got the. Uh, Got the GIF and all that. Went home, edited the video, and when I and I kept saying sevens and seventeen. Now the kid that was at my workshop, I said, "Yeah, yeah. What would you like to have as your hang tag? Because on the hang tags in each sneaker, I put on the left side. But Dave Chappelle, his hang tag was the book that he said that he can't talk about Comedy Central at the time before they had paid him. But mm-hmm. he said, "Only thing I can relate to that is the Iceberg Sun uh, book. So I put that as his hang tag. Dr. Dre, I put the mixer as his hang tag. So the kid, when he said, he said hey, when the kid said that he wanted his hang tag to be number seven. I told mm-hmm. Todd, I said, yo, you know I've been saying something's Friday. I've been saying them all weekend. So you mean, uh, mm-hmm. he's like, yeah. Seven. So anyway, 12.17 p.m. was when I finished editing the video. And I looked at my email, and it was from the arena. And they said, hey, Akio, uh, keep in mind, we was already in negotiations since January for me to do other gifts for artists that come here in Baltimore. Hey, um, Keo, we want to um, connect you with our new branding director. And also, we want you to do a hoodie for Ludacris. Mm. How did that happen, Doug? How was, I, I, two days prior to the email, I woke up at 1048, seen a random ludicrous ad. Then two days prior to that, I go to the two days after that, I go to the to the to the to the store and I grab a Jeff and I say to myself, I'm about laughing. I'm about to be on my ludicrous. And then mm. that was at 7 a.m. And then at 12 17 p.m. You mean to tell me, somebody tell me I'm doing something for Ludacris, which I wound up mm-hmm. doing. I, I not only did not something for Ludacris, but I did something for Janet Jackson too. But that's just one story, dog, of just like the synchronicities and the, and the speaking thing. And like you said, the freaks of the universe. What, I could have, I could. some people don't even probably notice the stuff that the signs that be in front of them. I could have missed that. Mm-hmm. I might not have that. It was wild, bro. It's so wild. I got who's supposed to be thinking about that. Man. I'm telling you, people don't, and, and, and a lot of people have so many stories like this and they don't share them because people just not on the wavelength to understand. But I love that so much, man. Let me, I'm going I'm to share you a story, man, because it's just, it, it's probable as well. I remember I was watching this show called, I mean, this movie called Brotherly Love, um, starring Kiki Palmer in a, um, I, I can't remember the brother's name. I think it's Quincy something. Uh, I can't. It's one of uh, P Diddy's sons. Um, and, yeah, uh, the light skinned one, and and, and he mm-hmm. was in starring in the movie as well. And it was his brother in the movie. And I remember watching that movie. And then I put that aside. And I was watching uh, the High School Musical. Like man, months later. And I was like, man, this is the same actor from that movie. Oh, and he was in The Soloist. And he was in... I'm like, man, where are you at? So I do that sometimes. And I look up like, oh, what's more movies he been in lately? So I looked him up. His brother, Justin Martin. And um, he was in Flight with Denzel, a whole lot of stuff. And then I'm just like, oh, man, he ain't done movies in a while. I saw that he had gotten to some legal troubles. Um, and he just ain't done movies in, in a long time. Ain't done an interview in like, I don't know, eight, ten years, something like that. I was like, man, so when I'm really into my my podcast, I'm I'm trying to be the way I view myself in podcast, the way I view myself, in, I'm like, I'm trying to be groundbreaking. So I'm like, man, I need to break this story. Something telling me I gotta break this, I gotta tell this brother's story. But he ain't had no social media, he didn't have a Twitter, didn't have an Instagram, didn't have nothing. I'm trying to find this stuff. I can't find him. I'm trying to find, you know, me. I'm I'm a researcher, man. So I'll find his cousin, I'll find this, but like I'm I'm telling you, man, if people knew how deep in research I could go, it, it, that's another story, but I can go deep. So I'm trying to find the relatives and stuff. And I found his little brother and I'm like, but I couldn't find any social media for him. So I'm like, OK, so I sit back and I reflect. And then I think four months goes by, four months goes by and something randomly happened. I forgot what happened. I might have seen a flight, the movie flight, a clip of flight. And something just reminded me like, Michael, let me let me go check. Um. Let me go check social media. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't still couldn't find the social media. Then I just let it go. I let it go and I kept doing my work. I had moved to Atlanta at that time, moving and shaking. 
And then I think I randomly had saw a like on my page on Breaking the Machine page, my podcast page. And it said, Justin Martin, just like your post. I'm just like, this is random. Let me see who this is. I press on it. And it's Justin Martin. He had his social his, his social media was deactivated. He had followed my podcast the whole time. He just had periodically deactivated his page. So every time I check, I never seen. When I finally met the brother, he was like, "Bro, yeah, I've been a fan." Like, but anyway, I had saw that he followed me, and he had been a fan of the page and the fan of the podcast. He had been leaving comments. Period. I never had caught none of it, and I had reached out to him. I'm like, bro. I need to get you on the show. You have no idea. I've been trying to get you on the show for he like, you've been trying to keep. I'm like, bro, I've been looking for you to tell your story. Long story short, he ends up flying to Atlanta for the interview, man. We said it all, we put it together, we sit down, we have a conversation. I'm like, bro, you have no idea like how aligned this is. You had to tell your story today because I have literally been in search for you. And he told his story, man, everything that he'd been going through, man, getting the stuff. It was the first interview he did in eight years, man. And I was just like, I was telling my partner Spain when we was doing this, I was like, bro, this is history, bro. I don't care what he does after the big things and all these different things, but this moment is history right now. This moment is history because a man is telling his story. A man who, you know, rose from, Hollywood fame to doing, you know, working with Denzel. He he grew up on Broadway doing The Lion King. Like, man, all these smart, like, bro, we doing his and, and something was just impregnant. Something hit my mind. Like, it's coming. It was like a it was like a warning. It was, I don't want to say it was a warning, it was like a signal, it was a sign. Like, wow. this brother is hey, bro. And I'm telling you, like, when you told this story, I'm like, bro, that man, I got moments, man. I got but, moments. But what is man. that though, man? It's like I be trying to figure out like that's stuff that you can't Google or that's stuff mm-hmm. that you because it happens many a times. It happened like with the Spike Lee thing, it happened. Uh I, I, there's so many things that happened in the recent months as well that I it's too many to name a few. But then it's like some people are not meant to receive it or some people, mm. it's, I feel like those are small um, uh, nudges that the creator gives us to be like, okay, yeah, you're on the right path. Well, yes, mm. you're big. His, you know, that, was, that was healing for you. That was, mm. I'm sure that was healing for our brother. You know yes. what I'm saying? Because, you know, I, I feel I feel somewhat of ashamed of when I, when, they, when I speak to 300 students at this uh, organization named Dent. And mm. every time I have to talk about those those situations, I'm not proud of it. You know what I'm saying? But I know that that's it's a it's a young man, a young girl in the audience that they are on the break of, feeling like they got the whole world waiting for them now that they're about to graduate middle school. Oh, I mean, sorry, high school. And no, no, you have to figure out something at some point. Even if you don't figure all the way out, just know that you know it, life can happen to us all quickly. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, just to be that and just to, be, just to share that and um, just for you to share your story of you being his voice and that was a sense of healing. I'm sure that was a sense of healing for him that, that it's, yes, yo, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? It's okay for us to to go there and for you to find that, yo, Doug, what is that, Doug? You 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 are actually, you, 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 you went somewhere, you know, spiritually to find and both of y'all spirits was entwined and connected, you know, as how, you know, with the Spike Lee thing, how this girl told me, hey, I don't see you actually meeting Spike Lee one day. I see you actually mm. working with him. Mm. It's not coming out of her nose from seeing my high eight documentary that was six minutes long. You get the rolling of the tape on the playback footage that I was about to post on YouTube, but I wanted to see somebody else's approval. And she, I came back in the kitchen and she was just like crying. I'm like, yo, what, what did you cry for? And she said, "Yeah, I would just see you meeting Spike Lee one day. I see you actually working with him. That was in 2007 and 2014. I only got to meet him on my birthday in June 28th of 2014. But uh, three months after that, which was the September 10th of 2014, I'm inside of his 40 Acres of Mule headquarters filming and interviewing him for my documentary, for Snoop, my first feature documentary featuring was, was Snoop Pearson, Grace at the Midnight. So it came mm-hmm. to light. You know what I'm saying? Um and it was in my subconscious mind, just like I'm freely able to express that to you. I might have not thought of it at the time when she was saying it, but I had it. I stored that in my subconscious mind and for me to walk walk into that. Because even how I met him the first time at in Brooklyn um, on June 28th, which is my birthday, on 2014, 
the line to get the t-shirts was all the way over the end. And it was so hot outside though. It was like nine degrees. And I told Shorty, I said, yo, I'm out to dip, yo. I, I mean, I, I wanted to meet Spike, yo, but I don't want to meet one of these kids. She's like, kill, just wait. Wait, I said, nah, yo, like, and then this guy come on, come on, on a bullhorn. He said, hey, y'all, I just want to tell you bye. Look, uh, we going to start the line, but this time Spike is going to be all the way down there. And right in front of me, Spike came from underneath mm-hmm. the tent. And I was the first one, dog. The first, mm. and she and she looked at me. This is my ex. She looked at me like, uh huh. You about to walk away? And then she was mm. trying to share with them at the time that I was filming the documentary was for Snoop. Like, hey, he always doing this, and you know he got a whole line, so he ain't trying to hear none of that. But she ain't had to say that, and I didn't have to say that because we didn't know that four months after that that I will be not only I'm the only one that probably was there that was at the no, I am the only one that was there September 10th at the headquarters that day. He said, hey man, I'm not going to direct me. Uh, you, you gotta direct me, interviewing them. You know what I'm saying? So it's powerful. Mm-hmm. And, then, and the documentary that is it, done well, um, you know, it, it got accepted at Sundance, but Fee, I call it Fee, as soon as she wanted to pull it, uh, because she was on Love of Hip Hop. Uh, that was, you know, we were young. She also was like, you know, some of the things that I regretted with filmmaking, I allow those closed doors to stop me from working, bro. I was just like, man, bump it, because like a lot of documentaries that I work on, pieces that wouldn't see the light of day. And I've allowed that to stop me. It wasn't all the way up until recent months, I'm going to say about a year ago. And then my friends was like, yo, and, uh, and one of my friends, I shot his documentary too. And he was just like, yo, dog, it's this time. Yo, yo, because you got that gift. That gift never, never, never went anywhere. And how mm-hmm. the universe is set up. The universe got, God has gotten you to do rap gifts for these production studios. And they don't even know that, yeah, you go beyond storytelling and shoes. You're really a storyteller. So I got directors that follow me, Doug, that, now that they see me with images of doing filmmaking, they're like, what? what, what we thought you just do the shoes. What's, what's going on here? So mm. it's time to unwrap that gift. You get what I'm saying? You know, so that's what that's the season I'm in now. You know what I mean? Like, all right, let me, you know, and um, because I've been working on the film of how Baltimore has saved the Air Force One and um, how we've, um, you know, it's Baltimore, man. We got so much history here, bro. But I've all, our people from NBC or Virgil Abloh, he's, everybody always told the story from their narrative. But we, Baltimore filmmakers, or people from Baltimore, never gotten a chance to tell our own story about it. So, mm. you know, and I just and I have friends that shout out to Kirby Griffin, shout out to Greenspan, who um, have uh, f- films on Netflix and have been in the industry now. So it's just like, it's just time, dog. It's just time. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, all the other projects I want to work on will, you know, finally be able to, um, if I, if I'm being diligent in it, that's why I'm doing the workshops, you know what I mean? Trying to create this small medium. Um, it's like, it's like I'm learning stuff all over again, bro. But mm. the manifestation tool will happen is just as the same as it happened even then. And now, um, I got some more stories with Richard Pryor, but I, I, I don't even hold the people, bro. Like there's so many, brilliant stories that come to mind when I think about, you know, like how did that happen about me stepping out the house? I get an opportunity that led me to LA. And then the same day that I go to LA, the guy who I went out there with, who was the owner of the store, who I did a collaboration with, we went out, we met off the strength of the Richard Posh drop that I was going to drop. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, um, the guy gets on stage on February 22nd, 2022. You say, hey, guys, I just want to let you know, on this date, Richard Pryor stood on the stage and he killed it. Man, the guy looked at each other like, yo, wasn't it the Richard Pryor show? This is the reason why you even came in the store in the first place because mm-hmm. you was looking for a final Richard Pryor record, but you couldn't find it. And you, that's the only reason why and you were burnt out. And Spirit told you. I said, yo, if you step out the house, you know, it's going to be a blessing waiting for you. I said, yo, just step out the house. This one, I was still working at Hawkins and I was burnt out, Doug. I was exhausted. Cause you know, we was working these crazy different pandemic shifts and I was like, go just get out the house dog. And then it was still a pandemic. So I decided to wear the same Richard Pryor shirt four days in a row because nobody seen me. Ain't nobody was like uh, eyeing out for me. So, and plus I wanted to see somebody in person so they could take a photo of me wearing the shirt. And that shirt was a shirt that led me to go in the sound garden and met the owner and the owner. And I said, Hey man, like, I, I thought you did this full time. Like, what do you mean you work mm-hmm. at Hawkins? I said, that's the reason why I came here. I'm burnt out. And I was trying to find a Richard Pryor worker so I can sell this Richard Pryor shirt. He said, hey, do you want to collab with three shirts? Like, let's just, you know, we launched a collection in December. Then I got a commission to do for Flavor Flav. And uh, and uh, I, he was like, yo, you might as well go out there to give it to Flavor Flav yourself. 
I said, nah, Doug, like, it's still a pandemic. And I was still pandemic paranoid. He's like, nah, Doug, yo, you should really. I said, all right. So we decided to go out there. And that same day that we went out there was where Richard Pryor had killed it at the comedy store that day. And then it didn't stop there. The next day I looked out the blind and I see the Bel Air sign on this bus driving by. And I could have very well missed it. And I said, yo, dad, it's crazy. I said, oh, I said, snap, let me look and see if the pieces that I did on the Bel Air show, if that's going to be shown today. I scrolled on. That's the only reason why I even installed that. The, I was stalking the show weekly. So I'm mm-hmm. scrolling through and sure enough, not not me having to click on the episode or nothing. The shirt, I mean, uh, the, sorry, the jacket that Will's friend had did, had uh, had, uh, had on was the jacket that I made and it was on a thumbnail. I was mm-hmm. excited. I, Brian, I said, Doug, yo, guess what? Yo? I said, yo, the day, yo, yo uh, what, not the shoes that I did for Will, but the jacket that um, they commissioned me to do for the show, it's, on, it's going to be featured today. So I just seen a, a, a Bel Air poster on the bus. I said, you had to take a picture with me out here in front of a poster, Doug. He said, yo, you know the meeting that we got today is in Bel Air? I said, no, mm. I didn't know that. So we goes to, be- so, 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 so we goes to, Bel- we goes to Bel Air for me to meet the famous drummer, John Dismore. And John Dismore was a little late. So then when you finally get there, Brian said, man, you got to tell him one of your stories, Keo, before you go. I said, man, I'm already late. I got to I gotta meet him with Ronaldo Green. He's a director who directed me on the city. He also directed King Richard that Will Smith was featured in. So mm-hmm. then I said, I got to meet him with him, yo. So he's like, all right, cool. But look, man, just tell him your story. I told him the story and went out there. And my Ubers kept canceling because when they when they, they said the, the valet person said when they keep going up the hill, they can't turn around because they, they turn around, the car will go off a cliff, like literally. So they got to keep going. So that's why they keep canceling. So then Renato calls me. He said, yo, bro, Renato, he said, yo, where you at, man? I said, man, I'm in Bel Air, man, but I'm on my way. He said, no, nah, man, look, man, look, I'm in the doghouse. Dog. Look, we just wanted to have this FaceTime call because the wife beat in the mall. Dog, she mm-hmm. said, I said, all right, bet. We had a FaceTime call. He said, yeah, I remember when I was in uh, Baltimore and I commissioned you to make uh, me a, a rap gift. And you said I overpaid because he did, yo. He paid for what a, a person would pay twice. And you told me that, yo, you wanted to throw in a pair for Will for just in case he might win an Oscar. He said, man, I tell you what, man, look, I want to go along and press the green light. Hey, man, I know you're LA now, but if you want to, you can come back for the Oscars. But if you don't have to, I know you, I know you still work, but if you want to, I said, no, nah, Doug. I said, I'm coming back out here. I said, yo, you know where I'm at right now, though? I said, no. He said, no, where you at? I said, yo, so you mean to tell me on the same day that my jacket is featured on the show Bel Air? <laughs> Peacock, that you're telling me that I'm going to be doing a, a pair for Will Smith while I'm in Bel Air? He said, yo, you just mm-hmm. in alignment, bro. So you see what I'm saying, bro? Like, mm-hmm. one shirt that I want to honor my uncle who passed away, who opened up for Richard Pryor. Mm. I'll be telling people, like, don't ride the wave. Don't see what another person is creating and create. What did your grandmother like? Or what did you, you innately, yo, you see what, yo, it got chills on my body. Yo, you mm. innately cared about that man's voice. You innately cared about why, yo, wow, but my, my brother need a voice. Why I need to, you ain't care about nothing. You ain't care about the accolades. That you wanted to, you, man, oh man, mm. the healing aspect. I wanted to honor my mother and honor my uncle who was still living at the time. Because my uncle, like he loved Richard Pryor. He said, Richard Pryor is funny in real life. Celebrity wasn't what it was that what we think celebrity is today, it was back in the day. Back in the day, when, on Pennsylvania Avenue, where all the entertainers like Red Fox and Richard Pryor, uh, all these individuals used to walk on the strip of where Pennsylvania Avenue is because the Chitlin Circuit, like effortlessly. And the Apple TV, they contacted me, the Alma, the director, she contacted me because she seen a piece of my uncle in the Smithsonian Museum. I thought it was an interview that she seen that I did online. It was a whole different of an interview of how he was talking about all these stars. And they said, just tell your uncle, if we can meet him or not, because he was doing dialysis, that he is one, I still got the screenshot. He's one of the main reasons why we wanted to create this project of his interview. So mm. the importance of digital real estate, the importance of me hashtagging my uncle, they were able to discover Tiny Tim Harris on my page to find me, to message me, just like how you was able to. It's all about research and it's all about the purest intention. And these things will attract, bro, if you are doing it with the purest of heart, when you want to give out of your heart, when you, you know, when you or when you do it from the heart. You get what I'm saying? Um, you said you said free, I forgot you we mentioned being open to it, being being open, having an open heart, bro, and, and, and being open to what you know can come out of that. Like I was open to, okay, what is these sevens telling me? Why I keep saying 17? Why I keep saying sevens? 12, 17 p.m. I get a message from, and I'm like, okay. 
And it, it didn't stop there, dog. I got more airy stories, but I ain't gonna go there, man. But it was so weird. Not weird, because I don't want words are powerful. It's it's amazing to witness. You know what I'm saying? I, I feel honored to be able to witness this stuff. And I'm like, is it because we're getting older, bro? Because mm. you know, or, or we just in still mode to be able to receive it in a way mm. where, you know, I don't know what it is, bro, but it it blows my mind each and every time. But I write it down though. Uh, paper people forget, but paper remembers. So I make sure that I write it down. You get what I'm saying? So that way I'm not. That's why I know the stuff, no dates and all that, because I make sure I'm writing it down, bro. And you have to write stuff down too, because when you actually doing these interviews, you got to make sure that you know what you're talking about. So there's power mm-hmm. in that, bro. There's power in the pen. There's power in the pen. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, bro. Yeah, it's funny because um, divine alignment. Um. Yeah, we could talk for days. Divine Alignment is actually a brother from Baltimore who introduced me to really got me deeper into numerology. The brother named Eric Bigger, he sent me a book called Numbers in You by Dr. Strayhorn. And I'm going to suggest that book for you, which is Divine Alignment. It's called Numbers in You. And I think seven is an important number to you. You know, um, I think it's a number that's following you. It might be your life cycle number, um, but you have to, you have to, um, to, to check out the book and it'll add, you just add up your name, you add up your birthday, all these different things, and it'll give you multiple numbers. But mine is a nine or eight, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's an eight. And then it represents abundance. He was breaking it all down to me, but he sent me this book and it sent me down like a, a opened up the world of numerology wow. and it makes it simple, bro. But I think that's the, the I'm like, Oh, I think I'm just catching the alignment right now. Cause the brothers from Baltimore moved out to LA. Wow. The brother Eric Bigger, and he told me he introduced me to numerology. And you talking numerology, you talking numbers, and I'm like, yeah, I think the numbers in you, the book numbers in you, I think it's, I, I think it's time for you to get that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's calling you right now. Like this is this yeah. is the, we wonder why we connect, why we have conversation, and then it's awful, and it's just like, oh, that's the reason. I was doing all this, thought it was for this, and it was that one thing. Like I had the conversation with him, and it wasn't till the end of the conversation that I knew why I had the conversation with him when he told me he told me about that book i was like wow i thought i was having a conversation because i thought you was just probably like when you we had this and he, i was like i needed that that's what i needed wow, man bro. but uh i appreciate you coming on the show man, man and spending a few moments you, with us and, and and just building and dropping gems on our audience man it's akio evans it's Ahmad the poet and this is one-on-one with the mod the poet we'll see you in the next one peace 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 peace